So welcome once again. This is Dr. Bart Rademacher, Prescription for Your Transformation, Real People, Real Success, and Real Conversations. And today I'm delighted again, as I always am actually, and it's kind of like my tagline, I guess, whenever I start these uh, conversations with amazing people out there. And, and today is also another example. But one thing that I really, that really gets me excited is finding those individuals that at a very young age are clearly on that path of success. And those are the ones that are also, you know, having many challenges in life, whatever they may be. You know, for some, they may be small challenges. For some, they may be big challenges. But whatever they are, they're challenges. And you have a choice when you have a challenge. Then that choice is to succumb to the challenge or say, you know what, I'm better than this. I'm going to settle for more. I'm not going to settle for less. And it takes a lot of courage to overcome some of these things, particularly because the environment is not necessarily a very friendly environment. And I'm sure that um, in her humility as the person for today talks about her past, doesn't really describe you know, how tough it was. And that I find quite remarkable. And so I want to welcome today to a magnificent woman and a woman that all of us really can learn so much from and somebody to watch out for because this person definitely is going to some very cool places. Maria Marelli, thank you so much for joining me today. Yes, thank you so much, Bart. Great to be here. So you have an amazing story. I mean, you already were on your path of success, really at the age of 15. And so for today, what I want to talk about is sort of like, how can we create that success? Because all of us desire success in life. I mean, if we're really honest with ourselves, we really are looking for having a better lifestyle, a better life, you know, more happiness, whatever it is. And we're giving a set of tools at a very early age and later on in life, depending on what schools you go to or what kind of you know, education you decide to have. And you, were, you chose to really go after that. And you also delivered a product to people that actually makes success a lot easier. So let's start off with just a little bit about your journey. Where do you come from and how did you get here today? Yeah, thanks, Bart. And I appreciate you crediting my success back to the age of 15, which is when I first started working. And I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do. As you know, many of us, you know, we think of these different careers when we're younger, but you might not be sure until you start to sort of tiptoe into the workforce, right? So I had to work three jobs to pay my way through college. And I started exploring different industries and things that I might want to do. And that's when I got started in project management. It was working at Caterpillar. Their headquarters was in central Illinois, a couple hours south of Chicago. And after that, went on to work at State Farm and planning out their projects in the systems technology department. And I went from learning about a traditional project approach to using Agile and the Scrum framework and just how to do work more efficiently, which then I carried forward. And now I consult worldwide uh, from Singapore, Portugal to Sweden, Vancouver, all throughout the US on helping companies find better ways to work and then also market their products. Nice, nice. So I guess you don't follow that traditional approach You go from A to B and then B to C because that can cost a lot of money and that can take a lot of time, right? Yes, and it's too slow, Bart. It's too slow. In fact, when I graduated from college, I graduated from Bradley University with a bachelor's degree. And my major, I had a, started with a general business major and then finished with marketing as my major with a concentration in professional sales. Now, I had a job offer. I had several job offers on the table because I entered a nationwide sales competition and won second in the nation. So that triggered a lot of just flurry of job opportunities. And I just didn't select any of those, actually. I turned all the offers down because I was like, which company defines me as a person? Like, I felt like it was this huge decision that was going to define my entire career, and I just wasn't sure. And as time went on, I realized that, you know, it's not about the actual job. It's about what you do with it. It's about, you know, what you choose, what step to take. But I had turned down a job that was more than the first job that I took out of college. And it was in fact $10,000 less. So I took a job, $10,000 less than another offer. 
And I thought, man, you know, if I work really hard, they promised me it was a better fit for a variety of other reasons and factors. And I thought, man, if I work really hard, like I can get, get up to that. And I was shocked by a big slap of reality when I was told at my yearly performance review, despite all of the great accolades I collected over the year, that they said, oh, I'm sorry, we have a new policy in place. So you can only get 5% maximum increase in your salary. Hmm. And Bart, I did the math. It would have taken me 10 years to get back to the salary of the job I turned down the year before. And so that was really the point where I was like, okay, this regular system isn't going to work for me because that's ridiculous. And the next year, I actually worked very hard, very diligently to expand my skill set, explore different industry certifications, got three job offers on the table, and I doubled my salary the second year out of college. <laughs> so that's what Agile's all about is how can you do what's most effective? It's a little bit of book smarts, but a lot of street smarts too. It's getting back to common sense and doing doing what makes sense. So uh, before I go into this whole concept of, you know, agile and, and how that actually works, because I think it's very important for people to really appreciate that. And I'm sure it's also what I call cross contextual. It can work in any kind of environment, which is great. So it's, it's not only in the environment of software industry where I guess it originated from, but it's in marketing and everything else. But what set, sets you apart? You know, what is it that, what's that drive inside of you that's allowed you to, to take on these incredible challenges and say, hey, you know what, I can do better than this? Yeah, that's a good question, Bart. And it's a little bit of a deeper answer because I remember, you know, when you're graduating high school, they ask you to write something in the yearbook, right? And I wrote down that I will be successful. And I think that comes from being fueled by humble beginnings and having a family that grow up. I grew up with, you know, very humble beginnings. We rented, never owned a house as a family. And my parents worked extra, extra hard, extra shifts to try to pay for my brother and I to go through private school. And, you know, it's debatable if that's worth it or not. I think it was, it was a good education, but they really wanted the best for us and they sacrificed in order to send us to a, get a good education. But it was a struggle and my family fell apart when I was 15. My parents separated and then divorced and my whole world crumbled and it was really hard for me. And what I realized was that I never wanted to be in a position in life where I couldn't look out for myself. And I think that's really where this all stems from was just this insatiable drive that I, I have trouble explaining. It's like this intrinsic motivation where I just want to make an impact and I want to do something meaningful and I just want to be the best at anything I do. And I think it really comes from that, from feeling helpless and feeling like I couldn't control anything and not ever wanting to feel like that again. But what's obvious too, and I can see that, is that you really let go of that past. You're not no longer living in that past and you've just embraced, you know, this energy, this fire inside of you, which, you know, I find incredibly engaging. And I'm sure that's part of your success is that people can relate to this energy, to relate to this, this passion and excitement that says, hey, you know what? I want some of that too. Teach me. Yeah. And it takes years. It's hard to overcome those types of challenges. And I still struggle with some things today, right? We all have have challenges that we were trying to work through and work past. But I do feel like there's been a big turn where it's no longer this spiteful, I want to be successful so that people can't hurt me. Now, I, I feel like it has shifted to, I want to inspire other people on what they can overcome and using that story and that journey to share what's possible. You know, and what's interesting too, and I, and I think, um, you know, this is a part of a, a field of, of neurology language and programming called neuro-linguistic programming. It's really understanding the strategies that we use. And one of them is very clear is that, you know, we all have this, a certain amount of potential. And when we take action, we get results, then we create beliefs about that potential. And so obviously you were challenged to, you know, to, to, to enhance your potential by taking action. And now you have the belief that you can do these things. That's great. Sometimes people don't ever get that chance or go after that, you know, uh, exploring their potential. They're just very subtle in their lives. And that's kind of unfortunate and never get to have the experiences that you have. So that's, you know, wonderful for you 
that you get to have those experiences and you get to be the best version of yourself, as I like to put it. So yeah, it, yeah, go ahead. No, no, you go ahead. I was just going to say, I think that a lot of that comes from pushing past limiting beliefs, mm -hmm. things that you might not even think is possible, but once you can achieve something and then get that momentum and take another small step, then we start to see, oh, wait a minute, I can do this. Mm -hmm. And I think there's, there's definitely a, just a turning point that you know, we come to that fork in the road. And then what you're doing is a great gift for others because as people struggle in their businesses, and I've had that personal experience myself, you know, it's interesting how, you know, we try to logically and sequentially think about things and that just takes a long time and it's very, very costly. And so that's also what you do and, and you have an academy, I understand, you have a business as well. You're consulting worldwide how to, peop how to help people, you know, um, work on their projects in half the amount of time or less than that. And you have an example you proved yourself in the very beginning. Well, share, share that example, by the way. Yeah. One. My most, yeah. Uh, one of my most successful agile ventures to date was we went to market more than 80% faster than 50 other identical organizations. And it was through a website migration project. And we did a vendor analysis, selected a specific vendor. And what we found was that they had some cold, hard numbers on how long it took to do an average migration. And it was three to six months. And we didn't have that much time. So this was for the Project Management Institute, Central Illinois chapter. And what happened was we had a conference the year before where there was a minor glitch on the website. What happened was people were registering for the conference and I think we were targeting about 300 people to attend and they you know, make the payment, it would send them a receipt and they would be, think they would register for the conference. But there's a very small glitch where the money wasn't actually taken off of their credit card very small glitch. So we had to go back and say, you know, I know you already made your payment, but we didn't actually get the, the payment come through. So we need to charge you again. And they look at the receipt and they'd say, wait a minute, something's fishy here. And they wouldn't register. They, they would just stop and then they'd contact their bank and try to get to the bottom of it. So it was very suspicious. So we lost a lot of those registrations and the conference went negative that year. Now, as a not-for-profit, we were just trying to break even or, you know, come out a little bit ahead, but we didn't want to go negative and we lost close to a third to half of the registrations. So we just found out that we were no longer going to be having web support from the web provider that we had and our next year's conference was coming. So can you see the risk and sense of urgency to get a new platform? Right. As we did is we had five months uh, before the conference and registration was opening and we had to find a new vendor fast. And when I talked to Mike Holstein from Proteon based out of Ohio, I was like, Mike, we don't have three to six months. We need to be up faster. I said, Mike, have you ever heard of Agile? And he said, actually, Maria, yes, I have. But, you know, a lot of these project uh, organizations, they're with the traditional project management institute. So they run their projects traditional in a traditional way. And I said, well, Mike, we need to get this done much faster what can we do? And we said, okay, let's use an agile approach. We had an offshore development team. Our team was spread across three different time zones, multiple cities, and we were able to go live in two weeks. Wow. So wow. that was just an exciting thing. And it was essential. It was a business need that the organization couldn't afford to wait. And since then, I've helped people launch businesses in less than a week. And you know, using these agile approaches, it can be one of the most effective way to get things done. I love it. You know, um, th that that's absolutely brilliant. And, you know, we were talking earlier uh, before the show and, and what's interesting too, is that this, this kind of approach, you know, too often people are wanting to make things perfect. And, you know, if you, you know, if you take that long to get something perfect and to launch it, whatever, it's, whether it's a product or a website, you know, it's really too late. And that's sort of the same kind of thing that, that you're talking about is helping people you know, do all the work, less time with less money. So what is that approach? If you, if you can give the listeners somewhat of an idea of how, what that approach is. Yeah, so Agile is a set of values and principles, and it was formalized in the Agile Manifesto back in 2001. 
And it was put together by 17 software developers, but this approach has been used well outside of software development today. But the reason it got so much attention back then in software development is people had multiple million dollar budgets and they'd go multiple years, sunk costs, and have no working functionality to show for it. So that's where it came from. They said there has to be a better way. What are some common values from all these other lightweight approaches that people are coming up with? So if you think about a traditional project, usually there's a requirements phase. Okay, what do we have to do? Let's say we're launching a new app. What is that app going to do? And then you go into, you know, plan out what that's going to look like and then go from requirements to design, then development and then test it and then launch it and implement. And right. that cycle can take months. It can take years. So I've worked on several projects that were like 18 months long. Now, if you look at the industry out there today and just the nature of technology, we can't afford to wait that long. There's going to be a new app. There's going to be some new innovation or innovative solution that could completely make us irrelevant if we're taking a year or more to release a new product to market. So what Agile is, is it says, what can we do now as a minimum viable product? So what's something that we can complete and then release? add more value and make sure that we have the right features and then we can release another increment and then another increment. And by using this approach, we can get to market faster, start to get market share, and then we can get valuable feedback and adapt from there. So Agile is all about really focusing on what's the minimum viable product, what's you know a minimal increment that you could release. So if you think about a website, you know, do you have to have all eight pages live ready to go, a back-end database built in, an interactive menu if it's you know restaurant or something, or if it's a if you're selling something, have everything available for sale. No, we just need enough to launch and be able to have one increment of that out there and we can add on to it later, add more pages. And so this is an approach that I use to run my business and that we consult companies across the world from Fortune 100, IBM, Microsoft, Bank of America, Disney, to mid-sized businesses and even entrepreneurs. So I have an interesting question. You know, is there danger of launching too soon? Is there danger oh, yeah. in the credibility? And so, so how do you overcome that? Because if you have a product out there that is still kind of clearly not complete, um, you know, are you potentially losing clients as well? Yeah, that's a great question, Bart, because how many of us have downloaded an app on our phone and then never opened it again, right? Like, mm -hmm. so many. So there is a distinction here that I picked up from a group in Indiana last year around Indianapolis, and they were saying that they use the term minimum lovable product. So I think it's finding the balance from the minimum viable product to minimum lovable product. So yes, what's viable? When can we launch? So if you had, say, a travel app, what when could you launch it? Once someone can book a one-way ticket somewhere? Well, yeah, you could. It's viable. But are people going to use that? Now, I would use that because I fly one-way tickets all over the world. So I would, I'd be the perfect audience for that. But it's not really a market differentiator for most of the population. So uh, most people would probably want a little bit more as far as features. So maybe like a round trip ticket or some other differentiator from the other travel sites out there. But right. it's really right. having that, that conversation of what's viable, but then what's lovable. So how can we make sure that not only can we release it, but it's going to stick and people are going to use it and they're going to get value from it. And that's actually where the agile marketing approach comes in because we want to make sure we truly connect with our ideal customer and then we have shorter cycles to test that market and any hypothesis we might have about that. Love it, love it. So I'm gonna introduce another idea and, and this is an idea that I've utilized in the past. And it's interesting because it's kind of like the same kind of concept, but with a completely different meaning. And the meaning that I brought to it is like, let me produce, let me deliver a product on the internet, for example, and and I'm just going to constantly upgrade it, constantly develop it, and really from the the principle uh, or the mantra, if you will, that says, hey guys, you know something new is going to come next week, just watch out for it, and so it delivers this excitement, this anticipation of, oh well, I want to stay, you know, engaged with them. It's just like you know watching any TV series, right? You know, like um, um, the, the not the what's what's it called the uh, I, can't, I can't remember right now. But any series, they they or any book, for example, or any chapter leaves you hanging at the end of the chapter, right? 
And so yeah, you started remember, to say V. I thought you were going to say The Walking Dead, and we were going to start talking about zombie apocalypses. Well, that's the one. I don't watch that one. Do you like? <laughs> like, is that one of your favorites? Well, I have watched quite a few seasons of it, and there definitely are cliffhangers at the end of each episode. <laughs> and so the way that I structure some of the work that I've done in the past is simply based on that. It's sort of like having people anticipate okay, what's going to come next, what's going to come next, what's going to come next. And now I understand your approach, which makes a lot of sense, because you have to get your product out there, because if you wait too long, you know, it, somebody, another app will come, in, come out and, and take over. So my question for you, what is that time frame? I know it's different for a lot of different things, but, you know, obviously 18 months is a long time. I mean, what do you feel today is, is that amount of time that you need to get something out? Yeah, that's a good question, Bart. And it's definitely can be different across different types of projects or industries. But when you look at Scrum, which is a rugby term, but it's also the most commonly used agile framework. And the time box that teams operate in is two to four weeks. Now, occasionally you'll see a one week sprint. They call it a sprint because it's a very focused period of time to get something done, completely done and ready to be delivered. But a lot of teams operate in a two week cycle. Uh, some teams might choose a four-week cycle, and that's okay, but you don't want to go too much longer than four weeks or else you start to get those mini waterfall tendencies of that traditional project approach. And so if you look at just two weeks increments or four-week increments, and you want to keep that length consistent across the course of your project, uh, you know, that's a really nice way to approach work is to create that time box and say, what can we do in two weeks? What's the simplest thing that could possibly work? Can this program say hello world? Right. So obviously, if it doesn't have enough robust functionality for the end user, you might do a release that's limited. You might not put it out to the world, but you might get some beta testers or get some people to you know, check it out and see how it's working in a limited capacity. Right. To limit any risk. But we definitely want to have a working product to get feedback on. Right. So using that term time box. Um, so throughout that project, then you just do what? Two week cycles for new elements, new new performance levels, new things. Interesting. Yeah. So as I develop my projects, I should do it in two two to four weeks. Interesting. It's been a proven technique, Bart. You should try it. So tell me a little bit about your academy. You have this wonderful academy um, where you go all over the world, I guess, and train people this whole technique. Yeah, so I've been applying Agile to product development, software development, IT departments for years. And one of the things that we realized a couple years ago is that you could apply it to marketing. And why marketing Like before any other department in a company? Well, because that's where the money comes in, right? Like that has a direct return in revenue. So I've been exploring with applying Agile for not-for-profit groups over the years. My good friend Suzanne Oliver is the founder of Heart of a Fighter that helps women veterans. So we've actually pulled her into our training classes, and we've actually done a project in class, in a two-day certification class, to help their not-for-profit organization and help women veterans in the class. So we've been exploring different applications of Agile beyond IT, but... A couple of years ago, about three years ago, I started working with Nick Cementa, and he's from Chicago, and we were both in Chicago at the time, and his background is very strong in marketing and advertising. Now, my major in college was marketing, and I had some background in that too, and he'd been very immersed in it for a number of years while I went off to do project management. Mm -hmm. So as I asked if he'd you know, work with me on Formula Inc. and do some business development, I dragged him along to my training classes and he started to learn these agile things. And he started to ask me these questions and he was like, wait, could this work for marketing? I was like, of course it can work for marketing. It can work for anything, right? Like, yeah, of course it can. And so we started applying agile to marketing with some of our clients. Now, within six months, what, our first client that we tried this with, we got over 300% increased revenue. And in a year, we got over 780% increased revenue. Now, I mean, come on, what company doesn't want that? And we were like, holy crap, like we're on to something. Let's replicate this. So we launched a case study program a couple of years ago to apply the same technique and how they market it. 
And the first person that joined this case study program was a dentist. And he said, well, I don't know if this will work because I don't do online advertising like other products because people need Medicare to pay for my services. And I don't know if I can find my clients online. And we tried it. We trusted the process, went through it. And the first campaign he ran yielded over $35,000. And we we're like, oh, we're really onto something. So that's what we formalized into the Agile Marketing Academy that we launched in January of 2016. Now, we, there, there's pockets of Agile applied to marketing out in the world. Like if you Googled it, you'd find stuff. But a lot of it's just theory. And what we did is we based this whole approach on stuff that we've seen work, on proven empirical data that we've actually seen firsthand. So that's what we went on to put into our curriculum and we developed a certification track for the certified agile marketing specialists and um, we've taught these classes worldwide. So last year we went to DC, Atlanta, Singapore, Bangalore, India, and just a couple of weeks ago we were in Seattle. So it's been taken off and the response is incredible. So uh, what's the schedule for this year? Do you know yeah, what the so we yeah, we've got some classes coming up in Tampa, Florida. We've also got some, we're going to go back to India. Bangkok. Sign me up in Tampa. I'll be there. Where at? Sign in me up Tampa. in Tampa. I'll be there. All right. Perfect. Uh, we'll probably, uh, we got some requests for classes in Shanghai and we got a request for a follow-up class in Singapore. So the reach is really global and it's really exciting. See, now I, I think I just figured you, you out. You just want to travel the entire world, and you just came up with this absolutely brilliant excuse to absolutely do that. I'm very jealous of you. You know, Bart, um, you're not wrong here, uh, but I've been traveling for the last several years, and I've been doing that teaching just, you know, agile applied to some of the traditional approaches, but... Uh, Agile marketing does help with that. It's a continuation. What you may or may not know is I've also launched an international DJ career over the last year. So I started DJing. Yeah, I DJed in Munich, Germany, in Delhi, Bengaluru, and Hyderabad, India, and then across the U.S. from downtown Chicago, St. Pete, in the Warehouse District, Philly, on the back of a Caribbean cruise ship last month, and in Seattle at a micro factory. Oh so, what kind yeah, of what kind of music? You know, it, it, I believe it's mostly categorized as house, but it's like really Love. a little bit more of a chill vibe. Um, it's, I'm still trying to find exactly what kind of music defines me as an artist. So I'm playing out around with different mixes and I have a pretty killer Bollywood playlist from India. I will have you know. That is awesome. That's kind of like my favorite music, by the way. Just don't tell anybody. Okay, um, cool. You know, Bart, this actually really is an agile lifestyle when you think about it. So three and a half years ago, I got rid of my apartment downtown Chicago and I've been traveling on one way tickets since. And it's an agile lifestyle of what do I want to do? Like, hey, I want to I want to travel. I want to do that. Oh, that sounds amazing. Well, there's ways to make it happen. And by doing that iterative and incremental approach, you can start to incorporate that into how you live. You know, I, I would love that idea. My only challenge is I have so much stuff that it would be a little hard to. I, I have to, you know, just, you know, hire a truck and, and a bunch of movers each time. I, I have too many things. Bart, may I tell you that, you know, an apartment in Chicago, two bedroom apartment downtown is not the biggest place in the world, I will admit. But when I started to sell things, it was the most liberating feeling ever. And it was like this just, not that I had a lot of weight on my shoulders, but it was such a liberating feeling. And like the opportunity alone offset all the stuff, right? And so as I accidentally accumulate stuff along my travels, I, I guess sometimes my bag will, you know, start to get overweight. I might, you know, buy another bag or ship some stuff to my next destination. It is hard to get rid of stuff, I will admit. Now, Alistair Coburn, I think, has it down. He travels Europe mostly and a little bit in the U.S. On, with a 50-pound bag and a backpack. And he does it pretty well because he constantly purges. So um, I think that's something we could all learn from. But I'll have you know, when you let go, it's amazing. The feeling is amazing. <laughs> nice. Well, I'm also an avid photographer. And so I just bought you know new cameras and things. And those are things I'm not planning on purging. So anyhow, um, this has been a wonderful conversation. Uh, I think what you're doing is absolutely impressive. I think your journey is absolutely incredible. 
and quite frankly, you know, a great example for anyone, anyone out there that uh, <clears throat> is is wanting to have a better life or just doesn't know how to get there and just realizing that, yes, it is possible. And, you know, coming from whatever kind of environment you came from, you know, from, from a challenge one or, or not a challenge one. And, you know, you prove it, you prove that it's possible. And that's, that's remarkable and lots of respect for you, but also in particular, your, your passion and your heart towards helping other people, especially with the nonprofit organizations. So I want to thank you for today. And this is the whole purpose of this platform, really to have people like yourself, you know, in, in this space so that people can find you and, and find new solutions and new inspirations to change their life because of exactly what you have done. And so my question for you is, how do people find you? If they want to learn more about the Academy, if they want to hire you as a consultant, you know, how do people find you? Yeah, thanks, Bart. You can find me at findmaria.com. And from there, you can click through to my website, mariamatarelli.com. Uh, for Formula Inc., that's Inc. with a K at formulainc.com. And then agilemarketingacademy.com. So that'll get you to contact me personally. I'm on all the social media platforms and you can find the links there from my site. And then um, we'll certainly post those links um, on this uh, Facebook page as well. And so if you were to have some last words of wisdom at the end of the show, what would they be? What I just want to share with others, I want to challenge you. I want to challenge people to think about, you know, what is it that you want to do who do you want to be? And whatever that is, you can do it. And it's just one step at a time. And that's what Agile is all about. Whether it's in launching a business or, you know, streamlining, improving your business, just the Agile approach is incremental. So it's one step at a time. If you have career goals, it's one step at a time. So write that goal down, look at what you want to achieve, whether it's this year and the next five years, and just continue to take one step steadily toward that goal. And that's going to get you there. And an agile approach is more fun because you see the incremental progress as you go. So that adds momentum and uh, it just helps you be more efficient in how you get there too. Love it. Love it. So thank you so much. And uh, we will definitely have you on this platform again in the future. I know that I'm going to have the privilege to be traveling with you too in New Zealand to an incredible experience. And, you know, I'm, I will also interview you there as well, as amongst the other thought leaders and transformational leaders there as well. But once again, thank you so much, and I'll be back uh, tomorrow. Sounds good. Thanks, Bart.